OK, well, suffering is almost over. But we have a couple more slides to go through. Um, so now, we, OK, so far we have only mentioned uh, losses that, have, that are 0 or 1. Right? So either you pay 1 or you don't pay if you don't make a mistake. But as you know, most uh, actual algorithms uh, do not work like this. You don't just count errors 0, 1. You usually have, uh, I mean, for the algorithm that work best, uh, usually they predict with a real valued outcome. So they don't tell you plus 1 or minus 1, but they, they give you a real number, which, of which you consider the sign usually, but you can uh, consider more than the sign. And especially, you can uh, take into account the magnitude of this prediction. And why do we do that? Uh, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, why, do, why would this algorithm be better than ones that would not exploit this real value? Well, one motivation for considering uh, different loss functions than the 0, 1 loss function is that, in general, if you want to minimize uh, the number of mistakes, so the 0, 1 loss on your data, the empirical error, it's usually computationally hard. And that's one of the main motivations for not doing it. It's because, say, for example, if you uh, try to, if you consider the class of function, which is the set of all linear hyperplanes, and try to find, given some data, the hyperplane that minimizes the empirical error measured by this quantity here, then you get the NP problem. So it's, uh, it will be very slow if you have a large amount of data to do such a thing. So you have to do some approximation, at least for computational reasons. And one way of approximating this, uh, this problem is to replace the loss by something that takes into account the magnitude of your uh, classifier. In this case, a linear upper plane would correspond to a linear function, and you, you take into account this line, the, the value of this linear function. And which means you replace this quantity by something like this, a loss function that compares uh, your output, which is a real number, to the target value, which is plus 1 or minus 1. And and the idea is to put here not a function which is like uh, here. Uh, the the, um, the indicator function is is kind of uh, is, is discontinuous and uh, is as a sharp uh, bump in a way. And you replace that with a function which is smoother, and then you get something which is easier to optimize. Um, another motivation, um, which is kind of related but uh, comes from a different perspective is that, again, if you look at hyperplanes, um, the problem with hyperplanes, if you are in the setting of this, this theory, is, is that uh, they have a VC dimension proportional to the dimension of the space. So if you have an infinite dimensional space, which usually is convenient to, to, to have, because then you have a, a lot of richness in your function class, then it has infinite dim VC dimension, uh, which is a problem for the bounds. And, but but as soon as you take into account the scale, and that's uh, John Schotteller has shown you these, these things before, so I, I won't go into the details. As, look, as, long, uh, as soon as you consider the scale, then you get a finite dimension. So it, it, a finite fat shattering dimension, for example. So here it's written to be defined later, but it's because it was cut and paste from another talk. Sorry. Uh, so it's good to have a scale. And that, so that's another motivation. But um, now another motivation, or yet another motivation, is that usually if you have a real valued classifier, you may expect that this, the information carried by the output is a bit richer than just predicting plus or minus one. But you, you may say, well, maybe the magnitude of this value gives me an, an idea of the confidence that I can have in my predictions. So that's also a motivation you may have to introduce real valued classifier. The, you, you may want classifier that tell you a little bit more. Uh, for example, you want to estimate, well, I call this the density, but it's really the probability of the outcome uh, or, or being positive, for example, or being negative. Um, so that would be one reason also for doing that. But we'll see in a minute that it's not necessary that uh, when you have a real valued classifier, the values are related to probabilities. 
it, it may happen depending on the loss, but it may also not happen. Okay. So the messages for this lecture are the following. The, the main motivation, I mean, out of all these motivations, the, the cr most crucial one is that uh, when we consider uh, smooth functions, and, and especially convex loss functions, then we are good in terms of computational uh, time, and that's why we do it. Um, and we'll see that, I mean, the, the main question is whether doing this, okay, it's good for computational time, but is it also good for prediction, or do we lose a lot when we do that in terms of prediction? And we'll see that, at least asymptotically, for certain types of loss, you don't lose anything. You, you are still able to converge to the base classifier, even though you're not minimizing the loss that you want to minimize, but some, some proxy. Um, but of course, there may be some influence on the rate of convergence. Depending on the loss function you choose, you may have different uh, rates of convergence. And, and then this bullet here um, refers to the fact that uh, what I mentioned uh, just before, there are loss functions that correspond to uh, classifier that estimate the probabilities, and there are loss functions that correspond to classifier that do not estimate probabilities. Okay, so, so again, a rewriting for convenience. I like to rewrite things. Um, the loss is defined like this. Maybe it's a bit too close, no? Yeah. Is it better? Yes. Okay. So, um, when you write the loss like this, now it's too far. <laughs> Um, you, I mean, the usual assumption is that it's symmetric to make a mistake on a positive example and on a negative example. So, okay, you can argue that this is not uh, true in practical situations, but you can adapt this theory for these cases. So, for this uh, talk, I will restrict to the situation where plus one is the same as minus one. There is no different meaning associated to them. Uh, in that case, you can rewrite this loss as a function of the product of y, which is plus one or minus one, and a real value the output of your classifier g of x. You can show that there always exists a function phi such that this is equal to the loss. And, and why is this interesting is that now this quantity here may remind you of something if you are familiar with SVM or with boosting uh, type approaches. Um, and this is called the margin of the classifier at a given data point. And now we can write everything in terms of this function phi here, which defines the loss. Uh, the loss of a given classifier is nothing but the expected value of phi of y times g of x. And same, the empirical uh, loss is the empirical estimate, uh, average. So again, we, uh, we don't want to, to, to carry over these phi, these y's, and these x's, and we just replace this whole thing, this phi y g of x, by a function of two variables, like before, we have a loss class, okay? So now we consider, again, functions that are non-negative and bounded, also we, we, I mean, we don't need boundedness uh, right now, but uh, for certain bounds, we, we may need boundedness. Um, okay, so if we look at this quantity here, which is, uh, the loss function, the expected loss of our classifier, we may wonder what happens if we minimize this quantity instead of the right quantity, which was the expected value of the zero one loss. So the first question to ask is, what happens when I minimize this? What kind of function do I obtain? Do I obtain the base classifier? That's the, the crucial point. Um, so, you, okay, it's a bit... Uh, messy to write it down, but um, it's complicated. So y may be either equal to plus one or to minus one. It's equal to plus one with probability, uh, with some probability. And uh, I denoted before, maybe I should write it again. I introduced the notation eta of x 
for the expected value of y given x equals small x, right? So that was the regression function. So, and, and I told you that this is equal to twice the probability that y equals plus one given x, minus one. Okay, so what is the probability that y equals plus one? It's one plus eta of x over two, and what is the probability that y equals minus one? It's one minus eta of x over two. So I just have to decompose my, the expectation of my loss uh, by saying either y equals one, and then I get phi of g, or y equals minus one, and I get phi of minus g, and uh, each time I multiply this by the corresponding probability. And that's why I get this decomposition here. The expected value of one plus eta over two times phi of g, and the same thing with phi of minus g. And now I can consider a fixed location in my input space, a fixed x. And for this fixed x, I have to find the value of the prediction of my classifier, g of x, that minimizes uh, what is inside these, uh, these brackets. Right? And that's this function here. So for a given value of eta, which is the regression function, I want to find a prediction, alpha, which minimizes this error. This is the error at a given point, right? Um, so before, if we uh, try to think again in the previous uh, uh, setting, uh, doing that would, would have led to the fact that whenever eta is larger than zero, we have to, uh, to choose a prediction which is equal to one, and otherwise we have to choose a prediction which is equal to minus one. So in the previous case, alpha, the best alpha, was just the sign of eta. But in here, because phi may be some arbitrary function, it may be different. And assuming we, we can compute this quantity, I mean, we, we can always compute this quantity when we know phi, uh, then this is the best error we can get at a given point. So the, the best overall error, L star, will be equal to the expected value of this quantity. So at each point, you, you try to do your best, and then you take the average over all locations. And that gives you the optimal loss. Okay. Now, what do you want uh, that your optimal classifier looks like? You want that at least it predicts in the same way as the base classifier. So at each point, your, your optimal classifier produces a certain alpha, which is optimal in this sense. And you want at least that this alpha is uh, of the same sign as the base classifier, because you know that ultimately you will use these, these real valued outputs by taking their sign, and when they are positive, predict with plus one, and negative, predict with minus one. So the sign of this best prediction should be the same as the sign of the base classifier. And this, this requirement uh, is called classification calibrated. So when phi is classification calibrated, it means that the optimal classifier with respect to phi is the same as the optimal classifier with respect to the uh, zero one loss. And this is expressed by this inequality. What you require is that when you minimize over all possible values of alpha your, uh, your error at a given point, you want this to be smaller than if you were to minimize this with the wrong value of alpha. So it's a, a bit complicated way of saying that the minimum has to be reached for the alpha that has the correct sign. Okay, so this is what I wrote here. So if for each, at each point, for any value of the, of the regression function, uh, the minimizer of my loss has the, has the correct sign, then I'm fine because it means my optimal classifier with respect to phi is the same as, uh, in terms of sign, is the same as the base classifier. Okay. Now, maybe it, this requirement is a bit complicated to write it like this, and actually there are ways to rewrite it if you have extra conditions on your loss function, especially the, the most convenient one is written here. So if your loss function is convex, which is most often the case, um, 
and, and what I wrote here, which is convenient for optimization. It's always uh, very nice to optimize a convex uh, functional. Uh, in that case, you can get the classification calibrated property that you require, provided that your loss function is differentiable at zero and has a negative derivative at zero. So it's, it's just at zero that uh, your function has to have a certain behavior. Uh, everywhere else, you don't care. And recall that the argument of this function is the margin. So when the margin is zero, the loss function should be decreasing locally. So maybe I can jump to the examples. And it turns out that most or all the loss functions that we use do satisfy this, even though they were not uh, uh, proposed because of this property. And that's, I mean, somehow it's a bit surprising that all the algorithms that exist in a way that are using convex loss functions use loss functions that satisfy this, this very property. So it, it's a good uh, sanity check, but it occurs afterwards. So the, the losses were proposed, and nobody knew whether they were good or bad losses, but now we know that they are good in this sense, at least. And um, so in this picture, I have put, so the axis here corresponds to the margin, so y times g of x. And whenever, OK, this is 0 here. In blue, this is the 0, 1 loss. So whenever the margin is negative, you pay a price of 1. And whenever the margin is positive, you make a correct classification. You don't pay anything. And the classical loss functions that are used are uh, upper bounds on this 0, 1 loss. Because it's, it's reasonable to say, if, if I minimize an upper bound on my loss, then maybe I also minimize my loss. Uh, and they are convex, so in light blue here, I have the, the squared error. Okay. In uh, green, I have the hinge loss. That's the loss which is used in SVM, for example. So it's linear. Okay, it's zero when the margin is larger than one, and it's linear otherwise, which means that uh, if you think in terms of hyperplanes and margins, it corresponds to the fact that when, the, when a point is beyond the margin and on the right side of the hyperplane, you don't pay any price. But as soon as it's uh, in the margin or on the other side of the hyperplane, you pay a price which is linear to the dist uh, with respect to the distance to the hyperplane. So, And all these losses, if you look at 0 here, they are all differentiable okay, and decreasing. So they all satisfy this classification calibrated property, which means if you minimize their expected value, you will get something which has the same sign as the base classifier. Okay, here are the expressions for these losses. Uh, the hinge loss, which is used in SVM, is uh, okay maximum between zero and one minus x. I call this the squared hinge loss. Usually, I mean, it may be used in SVM as well when you take the square of the slack variables, and we'll see maybe uh, later how this translates. Uh, the squared loss is this one. And this is the exponential loss, which is uh, usually used in, in boosting type uh, approaches. So now, <clears throat> one question is, OK, we know that uh, whenever we are classification calibrated, um, we are converging to the right thing, provided we are able to minimize our loss. But the question is now, can we get uh, a relationship, a quantitative relationship? This is qualitative of nature. Now, can we get a quantitative relationship between the error measured by the 0, 1 loss and the error measured by the phi loss? And it turns out that we can get such a, such a relationship essentially by looking at this uh, definition here. So uh, the idea is that if we compute the function, which is the difference between the left term and the right term, it gives us, I won't give you the proof, but it gives us a function which I call phi here. So phi is the difference between h minus, which is 
uh, the left part of the inequality minus the right part of the inequality. Um, it gives us this, this relationship here. The risk measured by the 0, 1 loss minus the risk of the base classifier measured by the same loss is related to the difference between the phi risk of my classifier and the phi risk of the best classifier in terms of phi risk via this function psi. And I give you directly what this function psi looks like. Uh, for the case of the hinge loss, it's just the identity function, which means we have a direct relationship between the, the difference of risk and difference of phi risks. We don't have psi here in this case. And in the other case, uh, for example, squared inch loss or squared loss, it's x squared. So essentially, we can bound um, the difference in 0, 1 error by the square root of the difference in squared error. And here you have other type of function psi. OK, so the nice thing is not only do we have a guarantee that we will do the right thing, but also we may be able to quantify how much, uh, how much do we lose by not minimizing the right uh, loss function. But then we can go even further. Um, we can even take into account the, the noise conditions. Um, OK, this is more for your culture than uh, uh, anything else. So um, if you have assumptions on the noise in your data, you may be able to refine this relationship. So this is somehow the, the crudest relationship that you can have without any assumption. And if you have assumption on you can get a slightly better relationship. So it, the formula is a bit complicated. In the case of the inch loss, you don't gain anything by taking into account the noise. So the relationship remains the same. In the case of the squared inch loss, you gain a little bit in the power. Instead of square root, you, you may get something better. OK, maybe I'll skip that. So, uh, OK, so these are results that you may obtain if you plug uh, this inequality into the previous. Uh, bounds that we had in, in the previous lecture. Uh, okay. okay, so now the next important thing that, that I want to tell you is that um, regarding the question of what does this real valued output of your classifier mean? So I told you that with all these losses, you are guaranteed that the sign of your classifier I mean, if you have a, a rich enough class of function, if you minimize the error, and if you have enough data, your uh, classifier will have the correct sign. It will the s have the same sign as the base classifier. So that's good. But then the question is, for this classifier, what does it mean, the real value that it produces? Well, then there are, here there are two cases. If you are in the hinge loss situation, so if you have a loss that is uh, piecewise linear around zero, then you may show that uh, the real valued output of your classifier does not have any relationship with the uh, regression function. So it, in no way can you hope that there is a relationship between the output of your classifier and the probabilities. So it's hopeless to try to get the output of your SVM in the case of the hinge loss and interpret that in any way as a probability. At least what this tells you is that asymptotically, um, the only thing you can say is that the sign will be correct, but uh, the, the value may, will never converge to the probability, except, except in the special case where you don't have any noise in which case the probability is either 0 or 1, and that's fine because your classifier will have value uh, minus 1 or 1, and that you can interpret as a probability, but that's a bit trivial. And in the other cases, I call that, so these kind of losses, which don't give you any information about the regression function, I call them classification uh, losses. And the hinge loss is such a classification loss. Now, the other type of loss, like the squared hinge loss, the squared error, or the exponential, uh, 
uh, I call them regression loss because they can give you a, a relationship, uh, okay, so an information, sorry, uh, about the probability. And in the case, um, I realize that I don't have the appropriate slides, so that's why I'm doing all orally. So I hope it's not too misleading. But let me try to rephrase that. So in the case of the hinge loss, so phi of x is the max between 0 and 1 minus x. In this case, uh, your optimal classifier, g star of x, is uh, either, say, plus 1 when the regression function is strictly positive. So that's, that's what we expected. It has the right sign. And it, it has to have this value. Any other value would be suboptimal. So which means we don't get any information about eta beyond the sign of eta. Um, it's minus 1 when eta is less than 0. And it can be anything between plus 1 and minus 1 uh, yes, when eta equals 0. So in the, in the case where you have uh, maximum noise, then any value would do it. And what I did, uh, forgot is that when eta is equal to plus 1, so in the case you don't have any noise, then your classifier can be anything larger than plus 1. So, and that's the only case where values larger than plus 1 are allowed, if you want. And same thing, when eta is minus 1, you can get anything less than minus 1, equal or less than minus 1. So that's the situation for the hinge loss. Now, if you take the squared hinge loss, so you just square this term, or you take the squared error, so you remove the max with 0, um, the situation is completely different, and it's, di and, and it's actually much simpler. In that case, the best classifier is just equal to eta of x, which means, again, asymptotically, with a rich enough class of function, what you will converge towards is the regression function. So with this type of losses, the squared, squared ones, you will get a, the output of your classifier will be exactly the regression function. And in that case, you can easily interpret this as a probability. There is no problem. So this is the fundamental difference between the losses. And that's my take-home messages for this, uh, for this lecture. Um, maybe one little thing that I can mention also uh, relating um, rates of convergence. So in the case of the regression losses, or maybe, maybe you wonder what happens in the case of the exponential. <laughs> and in that case, you get a function of the uh, regression function, which is, uh, well, I don't remember, something like log 1 plus eta over minus, uh, 1 minus eta. Um, but again, it, it's a bijective function in the sense that you can directly take the output of your classifier, modify it via a function, and get a probability. So in that case, also, you are allowed to interpret this as a probability. And now there is another difference between classification and regression losses. Uh, and the difference is uh, in where does the noise behavior uh, enter in the bounds. So uh, I told you in the case of a hinge loss, there is a direct relationship between the risk measured by the 0, 1 loss and, bit, and by the phi loss. And this direct relationship is not affected by the conditions on the noise. Uh, however, the conditions on the noise will affect the other part of the error, which is the, um, uh, the rate of the estimation error. So in a way, you can directly relate your 0, 1 loss to your phi loss. But then when you want to bound this phi loss, if, if you apply the bounds uh, that we uh, discussed in previous lecture, you will get something that depends on the noise level. 
In the squared loss, it's, it's uh, completely different. You will get um, a, a relationship between the 0, 1 loss and the phi loss, which depends on the noise. But then when you apply of previous lecture to this uh, squared loss, uh, the result will not depend on the noise. So it's just that the noise enter at two different places. So this is also uh, uh, an interesting difference, and um, especially because it affects the way you trade off between estimation error and approximation error. So it will affect the, the rate of convergence of your error as, the, as you increase the size of your class of function. Okay, so now we can wrap up. And so again, convex loss functions were introduced historically mainly because they are convenient for optimization. And especially in SVM, actually, the loss function was just something uh, that was convenient for, I mean, computationally convenient. And nobody ever wondered whether using this loss function was uh, a sensible thing to do. And somehow it came later that we realized that this is right. And, um, and because you have this classification pro calibrated property. Okay, I, I also told you that depending on the loss function, you may have different uh, influences on the rate of convergence. And the crucial thing, which I insist again on, is that depending on whether you have a loss which is linear around zero or uh, strictly convex around zero. You have either classification or a regression loss. And the consequence is that you may or may not be able to interpret the output of your real valued classifier as probabilities. And we can have a break. Thank you. Okay, I, I will start now. Maybe some other people will come. Um, I have to first uh, make you aware of something, which is that in the last lecture, um, things were becoming a, a bit more personal in the sense that um, as I progress towards the end of this uh, set of lectures, um, the more and more I put my personal point of view forward, so you should be aware that now it will be uh, where I put most of my personal point of view and where you should be very careful and uh, not trust whatever I say. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So I will, I will make claims that maybe, I don't know, I mean, you, that could be debated, let's say. And, okay, so now I'll... Uh, tell you a little bit how all these considerations can be applied to SVM. Um, and this will lead us to questions like why SVM are, are a good algorithm or why not? Um, and again, that will be your personal interpretation. So the take home messages for this lecture will be that, okay, why is SVM good? If you look at it from uh, far enough, let's say, um, the, the, ni the nice thing is that um, you have a smooth parameterization of your uh, objective function. So you have, let's say, a convex objective function, which is easy to optimize. Um, everything is somehow smooth. So this is a, a very good computational advantage compared to method that would, would be based on search in, in complicated spaces. The other thing is... Uh, regularization. And here, again, I, I depart a little bit from the standard uh, interpretation, which is, um, I mean, you probably have heard that the good thing about SVM is that they implement the so-called SRM principle, which is uh, uh, structural risk minimization principle, which corresponds to the fact that you, uh, you have a set of possible uh, 
classes or a sequence of nested classes and you try to find the best compromise between complexity or size of these classes and, and fit of the data. And okay, in a way it's true. I mean, it's really that that you are doing, but what you're doing is regularization and not structural risk minimization. And the difference is that in structural risk minimization, you have to discretize your classes and, um, and that's a very bad idea in, in terms of computational uh, properties. And uh, regularization is much better because, again, it's smooth, convex, and all that. Uh, and I, I guess that's the main, the main reason why uh, this is nice. And every good algorithm should be based on regularization. And again, I put this in quotes because that's my own claim. Um, and the last thing which is good about SVM is, uh, I mean, SVM should be, quote, uh, only based on RBF kernels or kernels that are like RBF, universal and flexible and locally preserving the, the structure of your space. Um, okay, and I mean, the, the, the idea is that uh, what makes the SVM good is not necessarily the margin or the sparsity or the support vectors or whatever, it's that uh, when you use it with a RBF kernel, you have a very powerful algorithm that can interpolate between the one nearest neighbor and some kind of linear classifier. And most, uh, in most applications where this works, it's because this is a sensible thing to do. And we'll come back to that. Okay, so how to, okay, I, I, I rewrite here the, the formulation of the classical SVM as an optimization problem. So this is probably familiar to you. Um, well, if it's not, just uh, raise your voice now or shut up. <laughs> <laughs> because I won't explain uh, more in more details. And now it's a bit too late because uh, it's the last lecture. Uh, so, okay. So I don't hear any voice, so I'm, I'm, I can continue. So it's the standard formulation and uh, where these psi i are called the slack variables. And in a way, when you see it like this, okay, you can notice some things, which is that it's a convex ob objective function with linear constraints. So it has, at least uh, in the good situations, a unique solution, and there are efficient procedures to find it. Uh, and then the question comes, uh, is this a sensible thing to minimize? And why would we minimize such a thing? And to answer this question, it's better to rewrite this in a different way, which would better emphasize what this is, going, this is actually doing. So the way to do it is to look at what these slack variables actually are doing. Um, if, you, if you keep everything fixed and you minimize over the slack variables, you will notice that the optimal value for the slack variable is either the one such that this becomes an inequality or the one such that this becomes an inequality. So you have to set your, sorry, your slack variable uh, all the way to the constraint, to the limit of the constraint. And this gives you this quantity here, the maximum between zero, which corresponds to this, and one minus this quantity, which corresponds to that. And now if you plug this value into the objective function, you get this quantity here where you have uh, eliminated the slack variables. So now you only have to optimize over W, your weight vector, and B, the offset of the weight vector, of the linear classifier. And we can uh, uh, rewrite this a little bit more to, well, that's a bit abrupt change, but okay. Um, so here, what this corresponds to is, is really the output of your classifier. W in a product with X plus B is really the real valued output of your classifier. So we can call it F of Xi. So it's a certain function of linear function of Xi, okay. Uh, and in, your, in the case where you have kernel, it's a nonlinear function of Xi, but it's say F of Xi here. And here it's the norm of your weight vector. So you can say it's the norm of your function. In, the, in a certain sense that we, uh, we can explicit. Um, so if you do this rewriting, you get something that looks like this. So it's a function of 
the, I mean, okay, I reverted the two terms. So you have the norm of your function times certain coefficient lambda. Lambda is actually the inverse of the C that was here. And plus a term which is the sum of a cost function, or I should have written phi to be consistent with previous lecture, of yi times f of xi, right? So what have we gained here? Um, it's just a matter of rewriting, so we have not gained much, but here it's much clearer that what we are doing is minimizing a loss function, which in this case here is the hinge loss that I uh, mentioned in my previous lecture, which is this function, linear here and zero here. So we are minimizing the hinge loss, convex loss function, plus a regularization term which is the norm of my function uh, in the Hilbert space corresponding to the, the kernel. Um, I don't know if, yeah, maybe I can explain what this is later on. Um, okay, so now we see that this is a very familiar form to those of you who have uh, attended Stefan Canu's lecture. And this is somehow the first explanation why the, doing this minimization is a sensible thing to do because when you do that, you're actually minimizing a regularized convex loss function. Okay? Um, and when I say capacity control, it's because you have this term that penalizes uh, functions that are complex. And in which sense is this true? It's written here. Choosing a kernel in the SVM corresponds to choosing a space of functions because what you will have is for a given kernel, you, here you would have, um, usually it's represented with a phi, the feature vector representation of the x in your kernel space. So here you have a function that involves the kernel and the set of all possible such functions is called the reproducing kernel Hebel space associated to your kernel. And when you choose a kernel, you implicitly choose this space of function and you minimize this quantity in this space of function. And associated to this space of function comes a norm, which also depends on the kernel. And one way to think about what these kind of norms associated to kernels are doing is this. I mean, it's a very rough interpretation. Um, such a norm is usually penalizing high order derivatives. So it's like if you were, being, were doing something like this, when you compute the norm of your function, you take derivative of certain order, order k, say, you take the norm of that, squared it, integrate it over your space, and that gives you the, uh, an idea of the magnitude of the high frequencies in your function, in a way. And you, you sum these for, with certain coefficients over all possible orders. And in a way, all kernels can be thought of as doing this, as generating norms that look like this. And depending on the kernel, you will penalize differently the high order frequencies. But somehow, the, the, that's the, the generic way of uh, thinking about kernels. So of course, when you want to minimize such a quantity, it means you will uh, prefer functions that are not wiggling too much that have low uh, energy in the high frequencies. So which means you will enforce smoothness of your solution. You will try to prefer flat functions compared to not flat functions. Uh, so that's for this term here. Now if we go to the loss term here, so I already told you that, but um, so the, the loss function is indeed the hinge loss function, which is convex non-increasing, it's uh, differentiable at zero and negative at zero, so it's classification calibrated. It is an upper bound on the zero one loss. It's of the classification type and it, it, uh, it satisfies this inequality, which means we can relate the error to the phi error. Okay, and like to relate with what I said in the previous uh, lecture again, uh, there is another version which is called, so this is usually called the L1 SVM, yes? 
Yes? Exactly. Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> Thank you. And um, so it's not always a good thing to do. It all depends on what you want to assume, in a way, on your target function. So in, in the, um, if, if we go back to, uh, to the previous lecture, so we know what we will uh, obtain once we minimize the loss, right? So we, we, we computed before um, that in the hinge loss case, we will obtain a function which is one or minus one, right? And or larger than one or smaller than minus one, depending on the noise, but uh, it will be of this type. So if, if you look at your regression function, your eta, that tells you whether you should classify positive or negative, and say it's like, uh, I don't know. In the case where you don't have noise, you always are either plus one or minus one, like this. Okay, and, and the idea is you want to approximate this function, in a sense, by a smooth function. But uh, it all depends in which loss you want to approximate this function. So if you want to approximate it in the squared uh, sense, it means you want to exactly follow the variations, right? Because we know that in the squared error case, uh, the function converges to eta pointwise. Whereas in the, uh, so maybe that's not a, a good example. So if we, this is a bit too sharp. So say we have something like this for eta. Then our, the squared error uh, minimizer would have to fit exactly this. And of course in that case, if, if this function is not smooth, then we are in trouble because we are trying to approach a non-smooth function with a smooth function, and th this means we will converge very slowly to the result. Um, but in the one, uh, in the, sorry, in the hinge loss case, here we can be anywhere, because this is, uh, the, uh, eta is equal to one, and in that case, the minimizer can be anything larger than one. Here, between here and here, we can, we have to be equal to one. So we have, uh, well, I'm a bit too far. We have to be like this. At this point, we can be anything. We can take any value. And here we have to be, uh, sorry, and between here and here, we have to be equal to minus one. So actually, this, this, this is like this. And then here we can do anything. And then back like this. So, um, so in the hinge loss case, any function that looks like this weird function here would be an ideal approxim uh, would approximate perfectly the target. So, so in a way, the conclusion is if the, in this family of functions that are allowed by the hinge loss, there are smooth functions, then it's a sensible thing to do to use the hinge loss. Uh, Another, I mean, even more explicit situation is when, when you have a, a, a regression function which is very wiggly here, very wiggly here, then approximating such a function with a smooth function will be difficult because we'll, you will try to fit all the wiggles, whereas with the hinge loss, you don't have to fit that. You just have to do this. So maybe it's easier, depending on the space you are using. But um, I mean, there is no, no way to say what, which one is the best, but, and actually it's, it's a bit disturbing to look at it this way because uh, it's hard to imagine that uh, the function, once you consider the hinge loss best approximator, is smooth, whereas it's easier to, to assume that the regression function is smooth. So, the, okay, so for the loss function, we're done. The regularization, we're done. Now, well, this you probably already know. 
So this, I guess, was also in John's lectures. So the idea is that if you have a set of hyperplanes, the VC dimension is proportional to the dimension. But in the case of the RBF kernel, uh, the, the, the dimension of the feature space is infinite. So you, you have potentially infinite VC dimension. But uh, if you look closely at what is, what is the output of your uh, cl um, classifier when you solve this SVM problem, it turns out that the, the vector W is not chosen in uh, an arbitrary part of this feature space. It's chosen in, in such a way that it can be expressed as a linear combination of the, of, uh, the input vectors, or rather the feature representation of the input vectors. So it's actually chosen from a space of dimension n at most. But, but if, even if you use this extra information, so you say, well, OK, my space of possible W vector is not infinite dimensional. It's finite dimensional. So maybe I can still use VC type bounds. Well, even in that case, you cannot do it because uh, the dimension of this space is n. So when you plug it into a VC bound n over n, it gives you 1. So that's why that's an explanation why you have to take into account the margin. And uh, well, here I compute the shattering dimension, but that's something that was already done by John. The Randmacher average is also, I think. So one thing which was not done is the the noise condition thing. Um, okay, this is just to mention that you can also take into account the noise even if you have the hinge loss uh, and relate, especially relate the variance of your functions in the relative loss class. So this is loss of your classifier minus loss of the best classi of the base classifier squared. So it's an upper bound on the variance. And this upper bound on the variance is upper bounded by the difference between the loss and the, be the best loss with some constant here. So it's the, the variance under certain condition, which is that the regression function is bounded away from 0. Uh, you can linearly relate the variance to the expectation, which means you can have a, a rate of convergence of the, uh, the cl classification risk to the base, uh, base risk sorry, uh, of speed 1 over n. But then if you look closely at what is, at what is the, the complexity term, so what you would obtain using these local Randmacher, what's going on? Oh, okay. If you look at the local Randmacher averages, remember there was this R star, which was the fixed point, the solution of the fixed point equation involving the local Randmacher averages at a certain radius. So it was the, the value of the radius such that the radius is equal to the complexity of the ball. So if you compute this quantity, it looks like this. Uh, so it's this. It's, or at least it's upper bounded by 1 over n times this. Uh, here, the lambda correspond to the eigenvalues of your kernel matrix. Uh, so for those who, who are familiar with SVM, again, I will not probably not detail things. But um, when you solve the optimization problem of SVM, uh, what you have to consider is the matrix of all kernel values at all pairs of points. So the, the entries of this matrix are k computed at xi and xj. Uh, so this matrix has certain eigenvalues. And the complexity of, uh, of the feature space, if you want, is controlled by the rate of decay of this eigenvalue. So you have to sum the eigenvalues, the, the smallest eigenvalues, starting from rank d take the square root, and you balance that with the dimension. So you have to find the d that optimizes this quantity, and that gives you the rate of convergence. And uh, in particular, if you have RBF kernel, so that, and that's an explanation again of why RBN, RBF kernels are good, uh, in this case, you can show that you have an exponential decay of the eigenvalues. And because they, ex they decay very fast, when you plug an exponential here, and you minimize over the dimension, you get essentially a constant, which means that this R star, which, which gives you an upper bound on the rate of convergence, is of order log n over n. So you have, 
1 over n rate of convergence in the case of the RBF kernel. Uh, that's why it's, it's good to use it. Well, that, or at least that may be a theoretical motivation for using it. Okay, um, maybe I skip that. Well, okay, let's, let's just go through it quickly. Uh, that may give you some ideas. So again, this RBF kernel, so this is the generic way of writing it. It depends on this parameter sigma which is called the width of the kernel. And the question is, what is the geometry of the corresponding feature space? Because that's where everything happens, in a way. Um, if you, OK, an easy thing to do is to say, well, what is the norms of the vectors in the feature space? A norm of a vector, so this big phi here correspond to the feature map uh, corresponding to that kernel. Again, I, I don't detail that because I think uh, Bernard already explain all this. So the norm of this feature vector is written like this, and it's equal to the kernel computed at x and x, which is equal to 1. So all the vectors lie on a sphere of radius 1. Okay, So that's, that's kind of surprising, because we start with a, a space, usually Rd. Uh, the, the vectors can be anywhere. But when we look into the feature space, they are all uh, somehow mapped into the surface of the sphere of radius 1. Uh, even more surprising, if we look at the angles, which are given by the cosine of the inner, uh, of the, of the, between the vectors, uh, the cosine of this angle is non-negative, which means that they are all uh, lying in the positive quadrant Right, so that's uh, the picture. It looks like this. So all the vector, all the vectors. So this, okay, it's a bit cheating to represent this in two dimension because this is a infinite dimensional sphere, um, and all the vectors will lie on this portion of the sphere. Okay, so you take all your points and you map them on this sphere. So what what happens when you do that? I mean, one remark which is kind of surprising because. You map a space which is flat yeah, in the, in, OK, you can imagine that your d-dimensional space is some kind of big rectangle with flat uh, uh, borders, in a way. And you map it to something which is very curved in an infinite dimensional sphere is very, very curved. Um, so you, you, you do uh, modify the structure of your space. But the, the, the good news is that locally, you don't do any modification. So it, if you look at two points that are very close in input space, if you look at them in the feature space, even though they are on the sphere, uh, um, the structure locally is not modified. So they are still close in the, in the feature space. And even more, if you look at three points that are close in the, feature sp in the input space, and you look at the angle between these points, you look in the feature space, the angle are the same, at least when you look very, very uh, uh, infinitism, infinitesimally. <laughs> Sorry. So that's what is meant by uh, this term here, flat Riemannian metric. And you can also uh, imagine, I mean, represent this in your mind by saying that along the sphere, the distance, so in, in this um, portion of the space, the distance is more or less the same as the input space. Distance. So we have not distorted the distances, at least the, the small distances we have not distorted. But the, the large distances we, have, we may have distorted a lot because if you take points that are infinitely far in the input space, well, in this feature space, they would be one would be here and the other one would be here. So they have a, uh, they are at finite distance, square root of two. So the distance, the global distance, are contracted by a large amount. Especially the larger they are, the more they are contracted. So in a way, you introduce a lot of ways to do shortcuts between, your, uh, between parts of your space. And that's why you, you actually curve it a, a lot. Because you take a big thing and you, you make it very small by curving it in all possible directions. Um, yes? 
Uh, that's a good question. It's true, I did not mention sparsity and why, where it comes from, but actually it does not come from the kernel, but it comes from the loss function. So it, it comes from the other part of the objective function. Yes. Of the function. Yes, so yes. The function, the solution is not defined. Well, okay, it, it, it will depend uh, on the problem that you consider. But, uh, okay, the, the two things are, are factors that influence the sparsity. That's true. Uh, but the main, uh, I mean, if you, if you change the loss function, then you lose completely the the sparsity, and and you can actually quantify uh, the sparsity with respect to your loss function, and you can. But sorry. But if you regularize in the in the particular state using uh, the same uh, function yes. of the solution, the sparsity should be gone also in some cases. Yes, you can also destroy it by so changing the. you're doing something a bit different. So if you, if you restrict yourself to uh, norm in reproducing kernel is both spaces, then what would be more influ most influential on the sparsity of the solution would be the loss function. Um, okay, so another aspect of RBF kernels is their universality, which is, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, a very crucial property. So, you remember that um, the solution of an SVM optimization can be expressed as a linear combination of vectors in the feature space, or in other terms, as a linear combination of kernel functions computed, computed at the data points. So which means that if you look at all, possible, all functions that an, an SVM can generate, they all belong to this space, which is the linear span of the function of the form k computed at x. Right? So this is, this is indeed the reproducing kernel in the space associated to that kernel. And that's the set of all possible functions that the SVM could possibly generate. And of course, the SVM will be good or bad depending on how big is this space. If this space contains a lot of function, then it means you can learn a lot of things. If it's small, you can't learn everything. Um, it turns out that if you use an RBF kernel, this space is dense in the continuous function, so which means you can approximate arbitrarily well any continuous functions, function, uh, and actually with continuous function, you can approximate arbitrarily well any function. So in a, in a way, your, your space of functions is rich enough to approximate anything. So in the limit, if you have enough data, you will converge. So you have uh, so-called base risk consistency in the sense that with enough data, your SVM will recover the base classifier. Uh, okay, another last thing about RBF is that there is this, this uh, width parameter, sigma, and, uh, and if you look at what happens when you modify this sigma, of course you change completely the geometry of your, of your feature space, I mean still a sphere and all that, but you, 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 you change uh, the repartition of the points on the sphere, and in particular, if you take sigma to zero, so you have a very small width, your kernel becomes a very, uh, becomes like a Dirac function somehow, then your SVM behaves more or less like a one nearest neighbor in input space. Um, and geometrically, what does it mean to have such a, uh, such a kernel? It means that when you take the kernel between x and itself, it's equal to one, and when you take the kernel between x and a point which is uh, slightly different from x, then you get something very close to zero. And which means that all vectors in feature space are almost orthogonal. So they are all at, uh, somehow at corners of this, of this quadrant here. So one would be here, one would be here, one would be in, uh, at the same place in, in each dimension. 
And since we have infinite dimensions, we can put uh, all the points in, uh, in different direct dimensions. And uh, on the other hand, when you take sigma to infinity, uh, the kernel becomes very close to a linear kernel. So uh, what you are doing is similar to using a linear classifier in input space. And geometrically, what does it mean? It means that kxy is almost equal to 1 for all the points. So all the points are very close on the sphere. And, uh, and, and the geometry, because they are very close on the sphere, is uh, almost not distorted. Because remember, locally, there is no distortion. It's only globally. So if you contract the region where you put the points, then you don't distort the, the, the geometry. So you are like in the input space. So if you put an hyperplane in this, in this uh, feeder space, it's like putting an hyperplane in the input space. And, and the nice thing is that when you tune sigma, when you play with the value of sigma, you can interpolate between all these, uh, between these two different regi regimes, and uh, provided uh, that the, the initial distance that you, are in, that you have in your input space, which is the Euclidean distance, provided this distance is good, at least locally, then you may find a good value of sigma that allows you to do a good job. So, okay, so the, the conclusion in a way is that when you use an RBF kernel, it will work well when the Euclidean distance carries important information with respect to the classification task. What I mean by this is that if two points that are close in input space with respect to the Euclidean distance have the same class most often, then an SVM with uh, an RBF kernel would do a good job. And if it's not the case, then it means either you have the wrong representation of your data or uh, the, the Euclidean distance is not the right distance to, to, to consider. And then, I mean, most algorithms would not do a good job anyway because you don't have the right representation. And it, and it works even better if the boundary, uh, the decision boundary is smooth because remember we are trying to use smooth functions. Uh, the, I mean, the, or at least we penalize functions that are not smooth. And smoothness can be adapted via this sigma. So that takes me to these uh, last take home messages. Um, so, SVM are good because you do regularization, and that's always good to do this because you, you can control in a soft way without imposing a structure, uh, a trade-off between complexity and fit of the data. It's good because you use loss functions that are uh, classification calibrated, so you are doing the right thing. You are minimizing the right quantity. And it's good when you use RBF kernel because you can approximate any function, so you're guaranteed that in the limit you will uh, find the base classifier, and uh, at the same time you have something which is, uh, which somehow respects the initial structure of your space at least locally, and that's usually uh, everything happens locally because globally you can't really say anything, and and that's why it's it works well, at least in my opinion. And and then I'm done. Thank you. Mm -hmm.